Come follow me, reading October 2nd through the 8th. Ephesians. For the perfecting of the saints. Do you see any connection between the messages in General Conference and Paul's epistle to the Ephesians? Record your impressions. When the gospel began to spread in Ephesus, it caused no small stir among the Ephesians. Local craftsmen who produced shrines to a pagan goddess saw Christianity as a threat to their livelihood, and soon they were full of wrath, and the whole city was filled with confusion. Imagine being a new convert to the gospel in such a setting. Many Ephesians did accept and live the gospel amid this uproar, and Paul assured them that Christ is our peace. These words, along with his invitation to let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away, seem as timely and comforting now as they were then. For the Ephesians, as for each of us, the strength to face adversity comes in the Lord and in the power of his might. Institute Student Manual Paul had defended himself before King Agrippa with such force of cer certainty and testimony that Agrippa was almost persuaded to become a believer in Christ. Because he had appealed his cause to Caesar, Paul was placed under the custody of a centurion and sent on his way from Caesarea to Rome. He was put aboard a ship with some other prisoners and sailed north to Sidon and finally on to Myra and Lucia. At Myra, the centurion, who treated Paul with great respect, secured passage for his company in a boat bound for Italy, which immediately put to sea in hopes of reaching Syracuse and Sicilia before the lateness of the season and the attendant storm would prevent progress. But the storms came as Paul had prophesied and drove them for many days. Finally, the boat was dashed upon the shores of Melita, without the loss of life, again as Paul had prophesied. That was Paul's fourth shipwreck, but neither this peril nor any other could dissuade him from his ministry or from his witness of the risen Lord. After the winter season had passed, the centurion brought his words into an Egyptian grain ship bound for Italy. Without incident, they arrived at Pituli, and from there, via the Appian Way, to Rome. At Rome, Paul was subjected only to house arrest and was offered great liberty, which he used to advantage, preaching and writing, preaching in the palace and in all other places, writing to the Philippians, the Collisions, Ephesians, to Philemon, and probably to many others. Our subject in this chapter is what Paul wrote to the Ephesians of the necess necessity, necessity for a church of unity, and the obligation of saints to bear one another's burdens, to extend the hand of fellowship, and to be as one. Why study Ephesians? Ephesians is an epistle for all the world, for Jew and Gentile, for husband and wife, for parent and child, for master and servant. It was the mind and the will of God in Paul's day. It is the voice of inspiration in our day. It is an epistle, an, an epistle of universal appeal and application. It contains some of Paul's best writing and is a document that deals with fundamentals with the gospel of God and all its saving grace. The epistle to the Ephesians reflects great depth in its teachings. Paul's main theme in this epistle can perhaps be be best be summarized as a setting aside of the things of this world. In order to grow in spiritual knowledge and partake of the unity and fellowship of the church, in the pages of Ephesians, the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will find many similar familiar teachings and practices that characterize the Lord's true Church in every age. What is the theme of Paul's letters to the Ephesians? Determining a theme in this letter is difficult. It does not seem to have the specific purpose of combating errors of doctrine or evil practices, as do most of his other letters. It is more likely a deeply spiritual sermon than a call to repentance. It seems to be directed to members of the church who have maturity and understanding, and therefore it reflects it reflects great depth in its concepts. Perhaps its theme could be best best be summarized as a concise and beautiful outline of how a person sets aside the things of this world in order to partake of the unity and fellowship of the church. It describes it in most in some of the most doctrinally beautiful passages of the New Testament, 
the ways in which the true saints saint takes upon himself the powers of godliness so that he may withstand the powers of evil. Who wrote Ephesians? The epistle to the Ephesians states that its author was the Apostle Paul, and Paul's authorship was accepted by many early Christians. When and where were Ephesians written? Paul stated that he was a prisoner at the time he wrote the epistle to the Ephesians, so Ephesians may have been written during Paul's first imprisonment in Rome around A.D. 61-63, to and perhaps at the same time he wrote the epistle to Philemon and the epistle to the Colossians, which bear many similarities to Ephesians. During this time, Paul was being held under house arrest, but he had the freedom to receive visitors and teach the gospel. To whom was Ephesians written and why? In the King James Version, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, states that the epistle to the Ephesians is addressed to the saints which are at Ephesus. However, the earliest manuscripts of Ephesians do not contain the words which are at Ephesus. This means that Paul may not have written the epistle specifically to the Ephesians, but to several congregations of saints, including those in Ephesus. Ephesus served as Paul's headquarters during his third missionary journey, and he had great affection for these people. In his letter, Paul addressed Gentile members of the church, who were perhaps recent converts. He wrote to expand the spiritual horizon of those who were already members. His main purpose were to help these converts grow in their spiritual knowledge of God and the church, to promote unity, particularly between Gentile and Jewish saints, and to encourage the saints to withdraw the powers of evil. Many saints in Ephesus were living righteously enough to be sealed up to eternal life. Following Paul's or following Peter's death, John the Revelator became the presiding authority of the church. And when John moved from Jerusalem to Ephesus, the headquarters of the church also moved to Ephesus. According to Christian tradition, Mary, the mother of Jesus, spent the remaining years of her life at Ephesus under John's care. Ephesus was the first of the seven cities that John wrote in the book of Revelation. What are some distinctive features of Ephesians? Ephesians contains many teachings and ideas that are familiar to Latter-day Saints, including foreordination, the, sp the dispensation of the fullness of times, the Holy Spirit of promise, the importance of prophets and apostles, the idea of one true and unified church, and the various callings and functions within the organization of the church. This letter also contains some of the most sublime teachings on the family that are found anywhere in Scripture. Introduction and Timeline for Ephesians Paul wanted the saints to understand the greatness of God's power and to attain the fullness of the blessings that God had in store for them. He helped church members understand that in the pre-mortal world, they had been foreordained to accept the gospel and to be holy. Paul taught that through Christ's grace, Gentile converts were no more strangers and foreigners, but saints in the household of God. In Ephesians, Paul describes some of the great purposes for the organization of the church. Apostles, prophets, and others who serve in the church help perfect the saints, strengthen the saints' faith in Jesus Christ, and bring unity to the church. Paul taught that following the example of the Savior can bring unity and harmony to our relationships with family members and others. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, Paul exhorted his readers to be more diligent, and obedient, counseling them to put on the whole armor of God. To the Scriptures Ephesians chapter 1, JST The saints are foreordained to receive the gospel. The gospel is to be restored in the latter days. The saints are sealed by the Holy Pro Spirit of promise. They know God and Christ by revelation. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and the, to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, to the saints. In his epistle to the Ephesians, Paul frequently referred to church members as saints. According to the Bible Dictionary, saint is a translation of a Greek word also rendered holy, the fundamental idea being that of consecration or separation for a sacred purpose. 
By referring to members of the church as saints, Paul was teaching that every follower of Jesus Christ is made holy, set apart from the world, through the atonement, and should therefore strive to be a holy person. Back to the scriptures. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Institute Student Manual Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 and 4 On what basis did the Lord choose his saints before the world was? There must be leaders, presiding officers, and those who are worthy and able to take command. During the ages in which we dwell in the premortal state, we not only develop our various characteristics and showed our worthiness and ability or the lack of it, but we were but we were also where such progress could be observed. It is reasonable to believe that there was a church organization there. The heavenly beings were living in a perfectly arranged society. Every person knew his place. Priesthood without any question had been confer conferred, and the leaders were chosen to officiate. Ordinances pertaining to that preexistence were required, and the love of God prevailed. Under such conditions, it was natural for our Father to discern and choose those who were most worthy and evaluate the talent of each individual. He knew not only what each of us could do, but also what each of us would do when put to the test and when responsibility was given us. Then, when the time came for our habitation on mortal earth, all things were prepared and the servants of the Lord chosen and ordained to their respective missions. To the scriptures, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, and when we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Institute Student Manual Ephesians chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. Redemption through his blood. Paul taught that grace and enabling power to be exalted is extended by God, the Father, through his beloved Son, and it is only through the blood of Jesus Christ that redemption comes. Back to the scriptures. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Come follow me, student manual. God will gather together in one all things in Christ. Why do you think our day is called the dispensation of the fullness of times? What might it mean to gather together in one all things in Christ? As you ponder these phrases, read the following scriptures. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, 2 Nephi chapter 30, verses 7 through 8, Doctrine and Covenants 110, verses 11 through 16, Doctrine and Covenants 112, verses 30 through 32, and Doctrine and Covenants 128, verses 18 through 21. You may feel inspired to write your own explanation of these phrases. Back to the scriptures in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being pre predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Institute Student Manual Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4-5 through 5 and 11 He hath chosen us before the foundation of the world. In Ephesians 1, 4-5, through 5, and verse 11, Paul taught that before the world was created, members of the church were chosen by God to receive the gospel on earth. This and other New Testament passages support the doctrine of premortal existence. The word predestined means appointed beforehand or foreordained. Foreordained blessings are not unconditionally guaranteed but are dependent upon the righteous exercise of agency in this life. Paul taught that those who attain exaltation were predestined to do so by being adopted by God, thereby 
becoming his heirs and receiving an inheritance of eternal life. Jesus Christ is God's only rightful heir. Therefore, to receive eternal life, we must be adopted through the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ in order to become heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9-11 through 11, The Dispensation of the Fullness of Times Paul taught that God would gather together in one all things in Christ during the dispensation of the fullness of times. The Bible Dictionary teaches, A dispensation of the gospel is a period of time in which the Lord has at least one authorized servant on the earth who bears the holy priesthood and the keys, and who has a divine commission to dispense the gospel to the inhabitants of the earth. When this occurs, the gospel is revealed anew so that people of that dispensation do not have to depend basically on past dispensations for knowledge of the plan of salvation. There have been many gospel dispensations since the beginning. The Bible suggests at least one dispensation identified with Adam, another with Enoch, another with Noah, and so on, with Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, with his apostles in the meridian of time. The dispensation of the fullness of times is a period of restoration and fulfillment of all the plans, purposes, and promises that God has revealed since the world began. It will bring to light the things that have been revealed in all former dispensations, also other things that have not been before revealed. He shall send Elijah, the prophet, and restore all things in Christ. According to the Doctrine and Covenants, it is necessary in the ushering in of the dispensation of the fullness of times, which dispensation is now beginning to usher in, that a whole and complete and perfect union and welding together of dispensations and keys and powers and glories should take place and be revealed from the days of Adam even to the present time. The dispensation of the fullness of times is the final dispensation, which will prepare the earth for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Elder B. H. Roberts of the Seventy taught, this is, this is the dispensation of the fullness of times, and we are we see running into it as mighty streams rush into the ocean. All the former dispensations putting us in touch with them, putting them in touch with us, and we see that God has had but one great purpose in view from the beginning, and that has been the salvation of his children. And now has come the final day, the final dispensation, when the truth and light and righteousness must flood the earth. To the scriptures, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, and whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit of promise is another name for the Holy Ghost. It is used in reference to the sealing and ratifying power of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit of promise confirms as acceptable to God the righteous acts, ordinances, and covenants of man. The Holy Spirit of promise witnesses to the Father that the saving ordinances have been performed properly and that the covenants associated with them have been kept. They who are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise receive all that the Father has. All covenants and performances must be sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise to have force after this life. When Paul wrote that the saints had been sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, he meant that they had been promised eternal life even though they were still living in mortality. When people are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, the Holy Ghost ratifies them as celestial inheritors, even though they are mortal. This doctrine is sometimes referred to as having one's calling and election made sure, or receiving the second comforter. To the Scriptures Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 13-14 through 14. The earnest of our inheritance. Paul taught that the gift of the Holy Ghost is the earnest of our inheritance. The word earnest here means a token of what is to come. In other words, this gift of the Holy Ghost is a foretaste of eternal joy and a promise of eternal life. The gifts of the Spirit also act as a foretaste of the eternal rewards that await the faithful in the next life. We are the purchased possession that is brought by the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. 
just as someone buying a piece of property often makes a token payment, sometimes called earnest money in the financial world, to indicate that he or she is acting in good faith and intends to complete the purchase. God gives us the gift of the Holy Ghost and its attendant peace to assure us that he will ultimately reward us with redemption and exaltation as we live faithfully. Our obedience to God's commandments and ordinances is the way we show God that we desire to receive the blessings of exaltation that he offers to us. To the Scriptures Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom or revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Institute Student Manual Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Literally, the original Greek phrase reads, having been enlightened as to the eyes of your heart. Anciently as now, the heart was viewed as the seat of moral character and spirituality. Paul's words imply more than just illumination of the mind and its understanding. They indicate an actual enlightenment of the whole man through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Back to the scriptures. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe, according to the working of his mighty power? Come follow me, student Manuel. God chose or foreordained me to fulfill certain responsibilities on earth. Paul spoke of the saints being predestined by God and chosen before the foundation of the world to be his people. However, as President Henry B. Eyring has noted, this does not mean that God must have determined in advance which of his children he would save and made the gospel available to them, while those who never heard the gospel simply were not chosen. God's plan is much more loving and just than that. Our Heavenly Father is anxious to gather and bless all of his children, or all of his family. All of God's children can accept the gospel and its ordinances because of the work performed for the dead in the holy temples. Although no one is predestined to be saved or not saved, modern revelation teaches that some of God's children were chosen or foreordained in the premortal world to fulfill certain responsibilities in accomplishing God's purposes on earth. As you read Ephesians chapter 1 and Gospel Topics for Nation, ponder how this truth applies to you. To the Scriptures which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and 20. Heavenly Places Ephesians contains the only passage in the New Testament that used the phrase translated as heavenly places to refer to multiple realms in heaven. In the latter days, the Lord revealed that heaven consists of three realms— Elsewhere, Paul wrote about varying degrees of resurrected glory and about his experience of being caught up to the third heaven. To the scriptures, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 23. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. In the lectures on faith, Joseph Smith described the Father and the Son as filling all in all, because the Son, having overcome, has received the fullness of the glory of the Father and possesses the same mind with the Father. Then he announces the conclusion to which Paul here only alludes. And all those who keep his commandments shall grow up from grace to grace and become heirs of the heavenly kingdom and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, possessing the same mind, being transformed into the same image or likeness, even the express image of him who fills all in all, being filled with the fullness of his glory and become one in him, even as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. To the scriptures, Ephesians chapter 2, JST. We are saved by grace through faith. The blood of Christ saves Jew and Gentile alike. 
The church is built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets. And you have and you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past on the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith, he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might shew the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, but it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Institute Student Manual Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8-10 through 10. For by grace are ye saved through faith unto good works. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8-10, through 10, Paul discussed the relationship between grace, faith, and good works. Ultimately, salvation comes through the merits of Jesus Christ's work, not on our own. Paul called followers of Jesus Christ, workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. This, place emphas this places emphasis on the Lord's work rather than on our own and teaches that our ability to perform good works stems from the change that the grace of Jesus Christ causes to take place within us when we turn to him in faith. Paul taught that we are not saved by either faith or works alone, as both are critical to salvation. Faith and works empower us to receive the merciful blessings of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained, Salvation in all its forms, kinds, and degrees comes by the grace of God. That is, because of his love, mercy, and condescension, God our Father ordained the plan and system of salvation which would bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Pursuant to this plan, he sent his only begotten Son into the world to work out the infinite and eternal atoning sacrifice. Men are thus saved by grace, grace alone, in the sense of being resurrected. They are saved by grace and coupled with obedience, in the sense of gaining eternal life. The gospel plan is to save men in the celestial kingdom. Hence, Paul teaches salvation by grace through faith, through obedience, through accepting Christ, and through keeping the commandments. Thus Nephi writes, Be reconciled to God, for we know that it is by grace that we are saved, after all we can do. And Moroni rec records, Come unto Christ, and be perfected in him, and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if you shall deny yourself of all ungodliness, and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then it is his grace sufficient for you, that by his grace you may be perfect in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. What does Paul mean when he says that works do not save us? I am not unmindful to the scriptures that declare by grace are ye saved, through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. That is absolutely true, for man in his taking up upon himself mortality was impotent to save himself. When left to grope in a natural state, he would have become and did become, so we are told in modern scripture, carnal, sensual, and devilish by nature. But the Lord, through his grace, appeared to man, gave him the gospel or eternal plan, whereby he might rise above the carnal and selfish things of life and obtain spiritual perfection. But he must rise by his own efforts, and he must walk by faith. He who would ascend the stairway leading upward to eternal life must tread it step by step from the base stone to the summit of its flight. Not a single stair can be missed, not one duty neglected. If the climber would avoid danger and delay and arrive with all safety and expedition at the topmost landing of the celestial exaltation. The responsibility is upon each individual to choose the path of righteousness, of faithfulness and duty to fellow men. If he choose... If he choose otherwise and as a result meets failure, misery, and death, he alone is to blame.
to the scriptures. Wherefore remember that ye were in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians chapter 2, 11 through 13, Uncircumcision and Circumcision. The term uncircumcision refers to the Gentiles and circumcision refers to the Jews. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, Paul emphasized a separation that had existed between the Gentiles and the God prior to the time of Jesus Christ. The Gentiles had been without Christ and were aliens and strangers, meaning they were not part of Israel. They had not entered into covenants with God. But now that they had entered into the gospel covenants with, with Jesus Christ, Gentiles who were once far off were made nigh by blood of Christ. To the scriptures. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, and verses 18 through 19. The middle wall of partition. The temple in Jerusalem contained several courts or areas, and only certain types of people could enter into each court. Gentiles were permitted to ascend the temple mount and enter the outer court, called the Court of the Gentiles. The inner courts of the temple, however, were shielded from Gentile access by a special partition or wall that stood about one meter high. If a Gentile passed beyond this wall, he could be put to death. Archaeologists have discovered two of the marble blocks that made up this barrier, and they contain inscriptions in Greek and Latin that reads, No foreigner is to pass beyond the barrier surrounding the sanctuary. Whoever is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his death, which will follow. Following Paul's third mission journey, some Jews in Jerusalem accused Paul of bringing Gentiles beyond the barrier, leading to a riot and ultimately to Paul's arrest. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 through 19, Paul spoke about the wall of partition, meaning the spiritual barrier that separated Jews from Gentiles and also separated Gentiles from God. These and all other barriers were removed by the atonement of Jesus Christ. Gentiles who accepted the gospel were no longer to be regarded as aliens, strangers, and foreigners. They were now of the household of God, part of God's covenant people. By accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ through faith, repentance, baptism, and the gift of the Holy Ghost, both Jews and Gentiles, members of the church, had access to God. In modern times, we enjoy the same blessings when we are baptized and live worthily. The walls between us and the Lord are removed, and we gain full access to God's blessings. We also become members of the household of God. To the scriptures, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have ac access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 20, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 15, the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Paul compared the members of the church to a building. Just as a building needs a strong foundation for strength and stability, the church was built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles discussed why a foundation of, an ap of apostles and prophets is crucial to the church. The apostolic and prophetic foundation of the church was to bless in all times, but especially in times of adversity or danger, times when we might feel like children, confused or disoriented, perhaps a little fearful, 
times in which the de devious hand of men or the maliciousness of the devil would attempt to unsettle or mislead. In New Testament times, in the Book of Mormon times, and in modern times, these officers formed the foundation stones of the true church, positioned around and gaining their strength from the chief cornerstone, the rock of our Redeemer, who is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Such a foundation in Christ was and is always to be a protection in days when the devil shall send forth his mighty winds, yea, his shafts in the world, when, yea, when all his hail and his mighty storms shall beat upon you. To the Scriptures In whom all the building filthy framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians Chapter 2, verses 20 through 21. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. The Savior referred to himself as the stone which the builders had rejected, which had become the head of the corner, or in the words of Paul, the chief cornerstone. A cornerstone is a massive stone that is laid at the corner of a foundation to give strength and stability to the entire structure. A cornerstone can also be used to connect two adjoining walls to form a corner. Paul used this imagery to explain that Jesus Christ provides strength and stability to the whole church and that through Jesus Christ, Jewish and, Jewish and Gentile members of the church are bound together. All members become united, filthy framed together, growing unto the holy temple and the Lord. All of this is made possible through the atonement of Jesus Christ, who is the chief cornerstone. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. How is Jesus the chief cornerstone? To the Jewish leaders, Jesus described himself as the stone which the builders had foolishly rejected in their construction, which now had become the head of the corner, or as Paul says it, the chief cornerstone. The symbolism is an apt one in this section of Paul's discourse. For the cornerstone anciently was the massive stone laid at the corner to bind fast the two separate walls into one solid whole. In Christ, both Jew and Gentile are bound together inseparable not to form two separate walls, but to create one unified people, forming a temple of the Lord. Jacob used a similar figure in the Book of Mormon when he prophesied that the Jews in Jesus' day would reject the stone upon which they might build and have safe foundation, the only sure foundation upon which the Jews can build. Back to the Scriptures. In whom ye also are builded together for habitation of God through the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 3, JST. The Gentiles are fellow heirs with Israel. The love of Christ surpasses all understanding. For this cause I, Paul, am the prisoner of Jesus Christ among you Gentiles, for the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word. As ye have heard that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery of Christ, as I wrote before in a few words, whereby when you read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 6. What is meant by the term mystery of his will? The term mystery of his will refers to God's plans that a person can discover and understand only as they are revealed by God himself. Paul was apparently speaking of the plan of salvation, a mystery to the world during times of apostasy. Paul indicated that the mystery of Christ is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and equal partakers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, an important part of the plan of salvation. Back to the scriptures. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of man, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold, manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purposes which he proposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith of him. Institute Student Manual Ephesians chapter 3 verses 11 through 12 
through Jesus Christ we have access to God. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 11 through 12, Paul taught that through Jesus Christ in our faith in him, we can have boldness and access to God with confidence. The word boldness can be understood as confidence in the presence of God. Because of the Savior in this life, we can freely approach God the Father through prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, and in the next life, we can enter God's presence with confidence. Back to the scriptures. Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that ye would grant you, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1-20, through 20, The Mystery of Christ. Paul wrote about the mystery of Christ that had been revealed to him. Here, mystery refers to a sacred truth made known by revelation. The mystery Paul wrote about is that both Jews and Gentiles can become heirs of the gospel covenant through Christ. This was a doctrine that in the other ages was not made known unto the sons of man. Paul taught that all those who follow Christ take upon themselves his name and become his seed and heirs of the kingdom of God, just as the Book of Mormon teaches. These teachings are evidence of Paul's sincerity and humility. His prayer for the Ephesian saints was that Christ would dwell in their hearts by faith and that they would come to know the love of Christ. To the Scriptures Ephesians chapter 4, JST There is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Apostles and prophets are essential to the church. The saints are exhorted to live righteously. They are sealed unto the day of redemption. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all loneliness and meekness, with lost suffering, bear, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace in one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. The word one appears seven times in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. Oneness and unity are important themes in Ephesians and in Paul's other writings. Paul constantly preached about unity and prayed for unity among church members. In modern times, the Lord revealed to Joseph Smith that unity is a key law of the celestial kingdom. There is only one true Lord, one true faith, one true baptism, and one true Father of all. Elder Delbert L. Stapley, the Corinth Twelve Apostles, spoke of the critical role apostles played in maintaining unity and pure doctrine. After Jesus put his apostles in charge of the church anciently, they preached the same unity of doctrine and practiced the same ordinances which Jesus had gave, given them. As long as they remained on the earth, functioning under the authority Jesus gave them, unity of doctrine and uniformity of the ordinances prevailed. The gospel message, which they were commanded to take to all the earth, was the same to everyone everywhere. People were not taught different gospels and then given a choice. There was only one plan for all. Because of the universal universality of these requirements for salvation, the Apostle Paul wrote, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one church, one authorized ministry, one orthodox gospel doctrine, and one Holy Ghost characterized the church of Jesus Christ in his time. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace is in all churches of the saints. Thus, God's revelation to leaders of the church of Jesus Christ was reasonable, consistent, and unified. It was only after the death of Christ's apostles that revelation ceased. 
pure doctrines Christ taught became diluted with the philosophy of the world, the profane innovations appeared in the ordinances of the church. Eventually, that which had once been clear and understandable became mythical and confusing. To the scriptures. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Jesus led captivity captive. Paul said that when Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, he led captivity captive. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained the meaning of this phrase. Jesus Christ overcame death. All men were the captives of death until Christ captured the captive captivator and made death subject to him or as the psalm from which paul is quoting continues to say he that is our god is the god of salvation and unto god the lord belongs the issues from deaths back to the scriptures now that he ascended what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth he who descended is the same also who ascended up into heaven to glorify him who reigneth over all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. What are evangelists and pastors? Paul listed the offices of evangelists and pastors as part of the organizational structure of the church. An evangelist is one who bears or proclaims the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Latter-day Revelation, patriarchs are described, described as being evangelical ministers. The prophet Joseph Smith taught, an evangelist is a patriarch. Wherever the Church of Christ is established in the earth, there should be a patriarch for the benefit of the posterity of the saints, as it was with Jacob in giving his patriarch a blessing unto his sons. A pastor is a shepherd or one who leads a flock, a fitting description of modern-day bishops, branch presidents, and stake and district presidents. Back to the scriptures. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we, in the unity of the faith, all come to the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. The authorities which the Lord has placed in His church constitute for the people of the church a harbor, place of refuge, a hitching post, as it were. No one in this church will ever go far astray who ties himself securely to the church authorities when the Lord has placed in his church. This church will never go astray. The Quorum of the Twelve will never lead you into bypaths. It never has and never will. There could be individuals who would falter. There will never be a majority of the Council of the Twelve on the wrong side at any time. The Lord has chosen them. He has given them specific responsibilities, and those people who stand close to them will be safe. And, controversially, whenever one begins to go his own way in opposition to authority, he is in grave danger. I would not say that those leaders whom the Lord chooses are necessarily the most brilliant, nor the most highly trained, but they are the chosen, and when chosen of the Lord, they are his recognized authority, and the people who stay close to them have safety. To the scriptures, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint suppleth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body and unto the edifying of itself in love. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Apostles promote unity of the faith. From Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, we learn some of the purposes of the priesthood in its offices. 
Paul recognized that a unity of the faith cannot be reached without the presiding leadership of living apostles and others. President Russell M. Nelson quoted Paul's teachings on the unity of the faith and then explained, The ministry of the apostles, the first presidency in the twelve, is to bring about that unity of the faith and to proclaim our knowledge of the Master. Our ministry is to bless the lives of all who will learn and follow the more excellent way of the Lord. And we are to help people prepare for their potential salvation and exaltation. Elder D. Talk Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles similarly provided insight into the unifying role of the apostles. In the Church today, as anciently establishing the doctrine of Christ or correcting doctrinal deviation is a matter of divine revelation to those the Lord endows with apostolic authority. Come follow me, student manual. The Church is founded on apostles and prophets, and Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. According to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19-23, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, and Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Why do we have prophets and apostles? Think about the messages from prophets and apostles you, ha- you heard during general conference. How do their teachings fulfill the purposes Paul described? For example, how have these teachings helped you not be carried a- about with every wind of doctrine? How is Jesus Christ like a cornerstone for the church? How is he like a cornerstone for your life? To the scriptures. This I say therefore in testifying the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Having the understanding darkened, being in light, alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart who, being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have learned him, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. And now I speak unto you concerning the former conversation, by exhortation, that ye put off the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the mind of the Spirit, and that ye put on the new man, which after after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. Put off concerning the former conversation. Paul's counsel to put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, and to put on the new man, use the imagery of setting aside old clothing and clothing oneself in righteousness. Paul devoted much of the rest of Ephesians to describing the saints' former conversation, meaning the unrighteous practices the saints should abandon, and defining the higher, more saintly manner of living they should adopt. To the scriptures, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Can you be angry and not sin? Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands for the things which are good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20, verse 29. No corrupt communication. Paul encouraged the saints to avoid corrupt communication which includes all forms of inappropriate speech, lying, deceit, vulgar or profane expressions, gossip, irreverent or disrespectful speech, and offensive, corrupt, degrading, belittling, or profane language, among others. To the scriptures. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 through 27, and verses 31 through 32. Can ye be angry and not sin? 
The Joseph Smith translation of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26 changes the confusing instructions, be ye angry and sin not, to the question, can ye be angry and not sin? This change brings this verse into harmony with Paul's other teachings about anger, such as his counsel to let all bitterness and wrath and anger be put away from you. When Paul wrote, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, he was teaching the saints that they should not retire for the evening until they had overcome their angry thoughts. The Savior similarly taught about anger as recorded in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, and 3 Nephi chapter 12, verse 22. Elder Lynn G. Robbins of the 70 taught, A cunning part of Satan's strategy is to disso dissociate anger from agency making us believe that we are victims of an emotion that we cannot control. We hear, I lost my temper. Losing one's temper is an interesting choice of words that has become a widely used idiom. To lose something implies not meaning to, accident, accidental, involuntary, not responsible. Careless, perhaps, but not responsible. He made me mad. This is another phrase we hear, also implying lack of control or agency. This is a myth that must be debunked. No one makes us mad. Others don't make us angry. There is no force involved. Becoming angry is a conscious choice and decision. Therefore, we can make the choice not to become angry. We choose. Back to the scriptures. Ephesians chapter 5, JST. The saints are exhorted to avoid uncleanliness and walk uprightly. Husbands and wives should love each other. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, is sweet-smelling savor. Paul taught about how Christ had offered himself as an offering and a sacrifice, thereby becoming a sweet-smelling savor. Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught, even as each sacrifice offered anciently as it prefigured the coming sacrifice of the Lamb of God was a sweet savor unto the Lord, so was Christ's offering of himself a pleasing thing to God. The sweet smell of the burning sacrifice in Israel symbolized the pleasing blessings flowing from our Lord's personal offering. To the Scriptures but fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an adulterer hath an inheritance in the kingdom of God and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. But not ye therefore be not ye therefore partakers with them. But ye were so sometimes darkened, but now are ye light in the Lord, walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord and hath no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever do doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Seek them that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what is the will of the Lord. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is access, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourself one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. 
Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loveth the church and gave himself for it. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 25. Paul's counsel to wives and husbands. Paul taught that all members of the church should submit themselves to one another, in other words, place others ahead of themselves. He then explained how the principles of submitting oneself applied in family and household relationships, starting with wives and husbands. For wives, this means submitting themselves to their husbands as they would to the Lord. For husbands, this means loving their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. If couples are truly united, then any sacrifice made on behalf of one spouse inevitably brings blessings to one's to oneself, thus he that loveth his wife loveth himself. President Gordon B. Hinckley stated, Happiness in marriage is not so much a matter of romance as it is an anxious concern for the comfort of well-being of one's companion. Any man who will make his wife's comfort his first concern will stay in love with her throughout their lives and through the eternity yet to come. Paul's counsel that wives should submit to their husbands does not justify male dominion. People in Greco-Roman society regarded the father as being the head of the extended family and the absolute authority over the entire household. Therefore, Paul's teachings represented a dramatic change to the traditional ideas because he defined husbands' and fathers' roles in terms of Christ's love and sacrifice for the church. Ephesians chapter 5 Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Paul declared that the manner in which Jesus Christ loved and sacrificed for the church was the ultimate example of how a husband should love and sacrifice for his wife. In our day, church leaders have taught that men are not to dominate family relationships, but, but by divine design, fathers are to preside over their families in love and righteousness. A woman need have no fear of being imposed upon or any dictatorial measures of, or of any improper demands when the husband is self-sacrificing and worthy. Husbands are commanded, love your wives, even as Christ also loveth the church and gave himself for it. Christ loved the church and its people so much that he voluntarily endured persecution for them, suffered humiliating indignities for them, stoically withstood pain and physical abuse for them, and finally gave his precious life for them. When the husband is ready to treat his household in that manner, not only the wife, but all the family will respond to his leadership. President Gordon B. Hinckley taught priesthood holders, the wife you choose will be your equal. Paul declared, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. In the marriage companionship, there is neither inferiority nor superiority. The woman does not walk ahead of the man, neither does the man walk ahead of the woman. They walk side by side as son and daughter of God on an eternal journey. She is not your servant, your chattel, nor anything of the kind. I am confident that when we stand before the bar of God, there will be little mention of how much wealth we accumulated in life or of any honors which we may have achieved but there will be searching questions concerning our domestic relations. And I am convinced that only those who have walked through life with love and respect and appreciate for their companions and children will receive from our eternal judge the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. To the Scriptures that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that ye might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Ephesians chapter 6, JST 
Children should honor their parents. Servants and masters are judged by the same law. Saints should put on the whole armor of God. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. In that ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in nurture and month. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In, uh, come follow me, student manual. Following the Savior's example can strengthen my family relationships. As you read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 33, and Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, think about how the counseling in these verses could strengthen your family relationships. It is important to note that Paul's words, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 24, were written in the context of the social customs of his era. Prophets and apostles today teach that men are not superior to women and that, and that spouses are meant to be equal partners. Even so, you can still find rele relevant counsel in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 33. For example, how does Christ show his love for the saints? What does this imply about how spouses as equal partners should treat each other? What messages do you find for yourself in these verses? Back to the scriptures. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men's pleasers, but as the servant of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Any masters do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 17 through Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9. Instructions to Congregations and Families. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17 through Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9 contains one of several New Testament household codes, which are set of instructions to wives, husbands, children, parents, and servants and masters. The codes recorded in Ephesians and Colossians Colossians are both given in connection with instruction on congregational worship. Since the early congregation of the church met to worship and partake of the sacrament in church members' homes, the congregation Paul addressed would have included all members of a typical Greco-Roman household, fathers and husbands, mothers and wives, children, slaves, and masters. In the household setting, the well-being of house, church, or congregations was inseparable from the well-being of Christian families. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9. Unity in Christ. In the household code found in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 through Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9. Interpersonal relationships are defined in terms of each person's relationship with Christ. Paul said that wives should submit to their husbands as unto the Lord. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ also loveth the church and gave himself for it. Children should obey their parents in the Lord. Parents are instructed to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Slaves should serve their masters as unto Christ and as to the Lord. Masters are to deal with their servants while remembering their master also is in heaven. Paul's words remind us that our relationship with Christ should give and define our relationship with all others. Ephesians chapter 6 Verses 5-9 through nine. The Christ-like relationship between master and servant Elder Spencer W. Kimball has shown that Paul's advice still his application today, even though slavery has virtually been abolished. Paul speaks of unholy masters and surely has reference to those who would defraud servants or employees and would not properly compensate for labors done or goods furnished. He likely has in mind men who are unkind demanding and unconsiderate of their subordinates. In short, the employer should treat his employees according to the golden rule, 
Remember that there is a master in heaven who judges both employer and employee. Paul likewise enjoined a lofty standard upon employees. We may take this to mean on on modern terms that the servant and employee should consistently give honest service, full and complete, and do for his employer what he would want an employee to do for him if he himself were the employer. Any other course calls for repentance. To the scriptures. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Institute Student Manual, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. What does it mean for a latter-day saint to put on the whole armor of God? Now, notice the nature of the armor that Paul puts on the man whom he is now preparing to withstand the powers of darkness. He said, Therefore stand, having your loins girt about with truth. Now the loins is that part of the body between the lower rib and the hip in which you will recognize are the vital organs which have to do with reproduction. He was saying that that part of the body was one of the most vulnerable. We should have our loins girt about with armor. And then, the next we would have the breastplate over the heart. Now in the scriptures, you will remember that the heart has always been used to typify our conduct, and so we would have a breastplate over the heart. And then he said, we would have the feet shod with kind of armor that would protect our feet, suggesting the feet as objectives, the goals of life which we should have girded by some kind of armor protected from getting off on the wrong foot. And finally, we should have a helmet on our heads. Now, there we have the four parts of the body that the Apostle Paul saw to be the most vulnerable to the powers of darkness. The loins typifying virtue, chastity. The heart typifying our conduct. Our feet, our goals, our objectives in life, and finally our head, our thoughts. Now the kind of armor that was to protect us is even more interesting. We should have our loins girt about with truth. What is truth? Truth, the Lord said, was a knowledge of things as they are things as they were, and things as they are to come, what is going to guide us along the path of pro proper morals or proper choices, it will be the knowledge of truth. There must be a standard by which we measure our conduct, else how shall we know which is right, and how shall we know which is wrong? Our loins shall be girded about with truth, the prophet said. And the heart, what kind of breastplate should put, protect our conduct in life? We shall have over our hearts a breastplate of righteousness. Well, having learned truth, we have a measure by which we can judge between right and wrong, and so our conduct will always be gauged by that thing which we know to be true. Our breastplate to cover our conduct shall be the breastplate of righteousness. With what shall we protect our feet, or by that, by what shall we gauge our ob objectives or our goals in life? All through the scriptures, there runs a phrase suggested by the king kind of armor the apostle paul would put upon the feet listen to what he says your feet should be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace interesting what is the gospel of peace the whole core and center of the gospel of peace was built around the person of him who was cradled in the manger how fortunate are you if in your childhood in the home of your father and mother you were taught the doctrine of repentance, faith in Christ, the Son of the living God, the meaning of baptism, what you gain by the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Fortunate is the child who has been taught to pray and who has been given those steps to take on through life, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then finally, the helmet of salvation. Did you ever... Here, of that kind of helmet, the helmet of salvation. What is salvation? Salvation is to be saved. Saved from what? Saved from death and saved from sin. When those two things are missing from this earth, and when it has been sanctified and cleansed of its impurity, this shall be the place of salvation. On this earth will be the celestial kingdom, for there will be no more sin, no more death, no more crying, for all the former things are done away. By whom? By the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said, in effect, the helmet of salvation shall guide our thinking all throughout our days. Well, now the Apostle Paul went one step further. He didn't leave the man just with the armor on and expect him to cope against 
in army seen or unseen. He had his armored man holding in his hand a shield and in his other hand a sword, which were the weapons of those days. That shield was the shield of faith, and the sword was the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I can't think of any powerful weapon than faith and a knowledge of the scriptures in the which are contained the word of God. One so armored and one so prepared with those weapons is prepared to go out against the enemy and is more to be feared than the enemies of the light. Back to the scriptures. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Come follow me, student manual. The armor of God will help protect me from evil. As you read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, consider why Paul named each piece of armor the way he did. What does the whole armor of God protect you from? What can you do to more fully put on each piece of armor every day? Back to the scriptures. And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. But that ye also may know my affairs and how I do, Tychus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things. Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that ye may know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Institute Student Manual Points to Ponder The Church has need of every member. When Paul wrote to the Ephesians, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints in the household of God. He was emphasizing to the Gentile-born converts that they now belong to the kingdom of God. This is a message that every convert to the church and every member of that matter needs to receive. You belong. The heart of fellowship can help people feel that they belong. It was back in the days when we had state conference in the afternoon. I was in a stake. It had been cold. It was winter. We came in out of the cold for the afternoon session. Everybody had had too much to eat and the room was hot. Everybody fell asleep, and it was my turn to speak. I was too sleepy to gather my thoughts, and not knowing what else to do, I asked for a show of hands of all who had come into the church in the last two years. There was a fine young man and his wife and two children right there. I said to the man, I know this is an unkind thing to do, but wouldn't you like to come up and take ten minutes to tell us how you came into the church and what it meant to you? He stood up. A really handsome young man, he said, you know, I came here from Palo Alto to work in this big chemical plant out here on the desert. I got my doctorate in chemistry and my wife has her degree in literature at Stanford. I knew all about chemistry. She knew all about literature, but we didn't know anything about getting along with one another. We had been we had been to see a marriage counselor. All, all we got was talk. We had been to see a psychologist all we got was a big bill we loved our children too much to be separated that was the only thing that held us together we both wanted the children we disliked one another my wife said let's try religion we've tried everything else i said okay what religion she said the mormon religion she had worked for a mormon in san francisco who she thought was the finest man she ever knew we went one day one sunday morning we drove around the block the first time no sign in front of the building to tell what church, what time church started. We had to case the place. So the next Sunday, we came and very sheepishly came in that, in that door. 
A man reached out his hand and took me by the hand and said, Good morning, glad to see you. Haven't seen you before. Where have you been? What ward did you come from? I was puzzled. I didn't know what he meant by a ward. Finally, he got the idea that I wasn't a member of the church, but he made us feel at home. Took us to our classes on Sunday school, sat with us, took the children to their classes. At the close of the meeting, he invited us to come to dinner on Wednesday. We came. The missionaries were there, and five weeks later, we were baptized. When we were baptized, the bishop was there, and when we, and when we were dressed, he took me by the hand and my wife by the other and said, Brother and Sister Romney, I want to welcome you, in the tr in, you into the church and extend to you the hand of fellowship. Now, Brother Romney, everybody has something to do in this church. We have a responsibility for you. We will put you in charge of the hymn books. Sister Romney, we will make you assistant secretary for the primary. Brother Romney, priesthood meetings start at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. Sunday school is at 10, and sacrament meeting is at 6. We would like you here 15 minutes early to see that all hymn books are in place. Will you be there? I didn't know what else to do but to say yes. I had been saying yes for five weeks. One cold winter day, when a blizzard was blowing, I plowed over through the snow with my little boy. We were all alone there in the meeting house, passing out hymn books, and I stopped and said, Joe, what's wrong with you? Here you are a PhD in chemistry, and you are passing out hymn books, coming over through a blizzard like that. I did it, but it wasn't long after that I, I got another job. Then with tears rolling down, his face, after he had spoken of going to the temple three months before, he said, There's a bishop so-and-so. I want to express my appreciation to him for giving me an assignment on the day I was baptized. An assignment commensurate with my ability. The message you belong needs to be given to all. Well, there's a lot to be done. There's brotherhood and fellowship and love and a welcome to be offered. Let me mention the new members and the less active mem people. When I saw the people coming into church, I thought of the parable of the sower. There were some of the seed, as you know, that burned because they had no roots. These wonderful folk often need the anchor of their faith sunk more deeply. They need to know they belong to something and to somebody who will take the place of what they have given up, the associations and friendships that are behind them. Let me, let me only know what a new convert said to us in the mail in England. You feel like you never are going to be lonely again, she wrote, and she shouldn't ever be lonely again in this church because she had become, as Paul wrote to the Ephesians, fellow citizen with the saints and of the ho household of God. Members of the church have covenanted to bear one another's burdens. Oftentimes there are those who have the idea that whether they actually fellowship others don't really matter. After all, they say, I'm the only person, whether I'm friendly or not, won't matter. How important are you to sh the strength of the church? What does it mean to bear one another's burdens and to comfort those that stand in need of comfort? Consider this conversation. Note some of the answers that you ought to, you ought to be prepared to give as you strive to bear the burdens of, an ex of and extend the hand of fellowship to those around you. The New Convert the missionaries emphasized to us the fact that the Church of Jesus Christ today, in its restored state, has the same organization as the Church of Jesus Christ in the days of the early apostles. I don't question that statement. What I want to understand is why this is necessary. Priesthood leader. While it is true that the Church today has the same offices that existed in the Church of Jesus Christ in the days of the apostles, this fact alone is not what makes the Church true, powerful, or distinctive. The importance of those offices was emphasized by the Apostle Paul. Read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. You will see in this letter the following purposes of these offices. 1. The perfecting of the saints. 2. The work of the ministry. 3. The edifying or building up of the body of Christ, members of the church. These offices within the priesthood were to remain till we all come in the unity of the faith unto a perfect man. The degree of that perfection was to be the stature of the fullness of Christ, or the status and glory enjoyed by Christ. New Convert I guess what I'm trying to understand is how these offices serve those purposes. Priesthood Holder Let's see if I can explain this. All offices in the priesthood grow out of the Melchizedek priesthood. The office, in other words, is supplemental to the priesthood itself. 
The purpose of the office is to help bring a man to a state of godliness, perfection, and unity with Christ. New convert. How does an office do that? Priesthood leader. Offices exist in the priesthood to perform these functions. 1. To preach the gospel and administer the ordinances of salvation. 2. To preside over congregations of saints. 3. To provide by revelation blessings and patriarchal lineage to the saints. By Latter-day Revelation, the Lord has broadly defined the functions of offices in the priesthood by these designations. 1. Those who travel to teach the gospel are called traveling ministers. Examples would be the Seventies and Apostles. 2. Those who preside or conduct the affairs of congregations and branches, wards, stakes, or dis districts are called standing ministers. Examples are deacons, teachers, priests, and elders. 3. Those who are appointed by revelation to give patriarchal blessings are called evangelical ministers. New convert. I'm not certain that I understand the difference between these designations. Oops. Present priesthood leader. Let's see if I can explain the difference by applying their function to a common pattern in the church today. Whenever we introduce the gospel to any areas in the world, a mission is created. The purpose of a mission is to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ to strangers or foreigners or non-members of the kingdom of God. Who introduces the gospel in various areas of the world? It is done by apostles, seventies, elders called to be missionaries. Once sufficient priesthood strength is established in a mission by virtue of convert baptisms, then under the direction of God's prophet, a stake is created. Stakes are created to perfect the saints. This is done by administering the ordinances of salvation and teaching the principles of the gospel. Who administers these ordinances and does the teaching? It is done by deacons, teachers, priests, and elders. In other words, the standing ministers. We see examples of their work in both branches and wards in the administration of sacrament, the teaching of classes, home teaching, and other presiding responsibilities, such as presiding over quorums of the priesthood. New convert. I see. You mentioned another office in the ministry, an evangelist, I believe it was. Priesthood leader, yes. The office of an evangelical minister. New convert. Is that like an evangelist on other churches? Priesthood leader. No, an evangelical minister is a patriarch. The prophet Joseph Smith said that there should be a patriarch for benefit of the posterity of the saints, as it was with Jacob, in giving his patriarchal blessings unto his sons. There will be an appropriate time when you will want such a blessing, which in the words of one of the prophets contains paragraphs from real eternal possibilities. Now let's go back to what Paul said in the text, that God gave some apostles and some prophets, traveling ministers, and some evangelists, evangelical ministers, and some pastors and teachers, standing ministers, for the purpose of one, perfecting the saints, two, the work of the ministry, three, the building up or strengthening of the church of God until we achieve a state of perfection and become like Jesus Christ. New convert. In other words, all these offices function out of the priesthood for a particular responsibility in the ministry. Priesthood leader. Yes, and because of the many duties in the church and the fact that God has endowed his children with different gifts and talents to perform these specialized functions, these offices are all essential. Paul drama, uh, dramatized this by comparing the offices of the church to a human body adding that the eye cannot say to another member of the body, I have no need for thee, or I am greater than thee. All are important to this vital unified organism, for the church members must be as one. Thus, these offices are and always will be in the church, in the true church of Christ, as long as the earth shall stand. New convert, I see now. The whole purpose of the church, its programs and organizations, is to help bless the lives of people. Priesthood leader, that's right. What does that concept mean to you, convert? Well, now that I'm a member of Christ's church, I have the responsibility to serve when I'm called priesthood leader. Is that all, convert? No, I guess I also have the responsibility to fellowship every person with whom I come in contact to make him feel as he is part of Christ's church. Priesthood leader, that's exactly right. We have all covenanted to fellowship and love one another. Unity can be achieved in no other way. What could this mean to you? Can you see how important the church is? Can you see how important you are? Do you understand why the church has been organized? 
Can you understand why each member is important in the success of the whole? Can you determine in your own life to strive to bear burdens and extend fellowship to those around you, to strive to be one with the saints? Can you strive to make a special effort to make someone feel welcome and a part of Christ's church? That was Paul's message to the Ephesians, and it is his message to you. Come follow me, student manual. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. To teach about this verse, Elder David and Bednar used the example of a rope. Consider showing family members a rope and letting them hold and examine it while you share parts of Elder Bednar's message. How is God gathering all things together in Christ? How are we blessed because of his gathering? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Invite family members to share experiences in which they have felt love and mercy of God and Jesus Christ described in these verses. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 through 19. Your family might enjoy building walls out of pillows or other objects you have at home and then knocking them down. While Paul referred to the wall between Gentiles and Jews, what kind of walls separate people today? How has Jesus Christ broken down these walls? How does he reconcile us into God? Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Your family could make their own armor of God using household items. The video, The Armor of God, can help family members visualize this armor, and they can find simple explanations in the whole armor of God. How does each piece of armor protect us spiritually? What can we do to help each other put on the whole armor of God every day? For more ideas for teaching children, see this week's outline and come follow me for primary.